All right, welcome back. Today we're continuing our Let's Learn ABA series with single subject experimental design. Single subject design is crucial for our BCBAs and BCABAs out there. The exam is going to test you thoroughly on it. You need to have a deep understanding of it. RBTs, if nothing else, you should be familiar with our ABA designs or our withdrawal designs. It's what you're commonly going to be using in the field. Either way, single subject design is a essential part of our field and what we do. So as practitioners, we need to understand at least the basics. And that's what we're covering today, right? The basics of single subject design. As always, if you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe. We would really appreciate it. RBT materials can be found at rbtexamreview.com. BCBA materials can be found at bcbastudy.com. We have a membership option now available. It gives you access to Discord. It also supports us, so be sure to check that out. Questions, comments, let us know. As always, work hard, study hard. Let's learn ABA. Quick intro, single subject experimental design, the most common type of design in ABA. When we do experiments and research in ABA, we're almost always going to be used using single subject experimental designs. Why? Because typically we focus on a small group of individuals, one, two, three, four people maybe, right? We're not getting huge samples. We're focusing on a small set of individuals, commonly one individual at a time. And what happens is individuals serve as their own control, meaning we compare their behavior back to their own behavior, right? We go from baselines to interventions back to baselines. Researchers attempt to predict, verify, and replicate data, known as baseline logic. Ideally, researchers want to prove experimental control. We want to show that our intervention, our IVs, are what is changing the behavior. That is the whole purpose. So we're going to cover reversal designs, multiple baseline designs, alternating treatment designs, and changing criterion designs. Let's start with our reversal and withdrawal. This is what it looks like. It's the most common. It's what pretty much everybody thinks of when they first think about single subject design. As you can see, we have our baseline, our treatment, back to baseline, back to treatment. That, in essence, is what we're doing with the reversal or withdrawal design. We're implementing an intervention and then removing it. In other words, remove an intervention to prove experimental control. Reversal and withdrawal designs are excellent at identifying experimental control because we are actually taking away what we added to change the behavior. And if we can take away what we added to change the behavior and get back to our original baseline, we can strongly say that we, in fact, have experimental control over the dependent variable. More commonly referred to known as the ABA design, so A being baseline, B being intervention, A being back to baseline. You might see an ABCA design. All different types of things can be done with reversal and withdrawal, right? But the most basic, most common is just a simple ABA, baseline intervention, back to baseline. After a steady state is achieved, an intervention is introduced, meaning we want a steady baseline, right? If we want to decrease a behavior and our baseline is already decreasing, we might not want to immediately intervene. However, if our baseline is steadily rising or is flat, then that might be a good time during steady state to go ahead and start the intervention. The intervention is withdrawn and the prediction of the baseline returns to previous levels is verified. We'll talk about baseline logic in more detail at the end. All of our experimental designs follow the same baseline logic. Some advantages. Demonstrates experimental control. Definitely the best experimental design for that. And it's relatively easy to set up and execute. You get your participant, take baseline data, you intervene, you remove it. Very simple to understand, very simple to track. However, there are ethical concerns with reversal and withdrawal designs. If we think about dangerous, high-risk behaviors, if we're effective at decreasing those behaviors, it might not be the best idea to reverse it. Say self-injury, design an intervention to reduce a self-injurious behavior. Reversing it's probably not a very ethical thing. Additionally, some behaviors cannot be reversed. If you're running a math intervention teaching someone to add you can't really reverse the skill of adding. Right? You still know how to add basic numbers no matter how long you go in between adding basic numbers. Some behaviors cannot be reversed. As always, for the exam, you want to know advantages, want to know disadvantages, and you really want to know what does it look like when we combine different types of experimental designs together. So next, multiple baselines and multiple probe. 
multiple baselines is on the left. So you can see right here, we have our sessions, our response measures. We have our three different baselines. And what the key characteristic here is, is that our intervention starts at different times. For one, our baseline goes for uh, seven data points, and then our treatment starts. While our treatment starts in one, our baseline continues in our other conditions, right? And then we're slowly implementing the interventions across these other segments. And that's how we're trying to prove experimental control, because if our baseline is steady across one, two, and three, and then each time we implement the intervention, the data changes, we can start to say we have experimental control. Multiple probe, very similar to multiple baseline, except you're only going to be occasionally probing our data instead of a continuous baseline. You can see in segment two, we've probed, let's just say square triangle circle. Let's say they've achieved it, whatever we're looking for. And then we probe a triangle let much later on. Same thing in three, probe the triangle, probe the circle. So multiple baseline, multiple probe. Typically, you're looking at three to five subjects. Obviously, you can't do this with one subject. You really don't want just two subjects. Ideally, you want three minimum. You can measure across participants. So Jim, John, James, measure across behaviors, elopement, back talking, and throwing objects. Or you can measure across settings, classroom, home, clinical setting. No matter what, you're examining an independent variable and the changes in each across participants or across behaviors or across settings. So for example, an IV in a classroom, a home, in a clinical setting, how is it affecting it in each, right? So interventions are introduced one at a time into each segment while baseline continues into other conditions. Some advantage, no withdrawal needed, which is great, right? We don't have to withdraw our treatment. You can examine uh, multiple dependent variables at once, right? If we have multiple behaviors, we're looking at these multiple dependent variables all in one experimental design. So very handy. And multiple probes can be great when time or resources are limited, or if baseline is if an extended baseline is not really conducive to the design either. Some disadvantages, sometimes difficult to demonstrate experimental control. There's there's a really big risk of confounds if we're looking at our baseline. If we go back for a second. Look how long baseline for behavior three is on the left, right? There's a, there's a high risk that something else might be affecting our behavior. So it's, and, and since we're not withdrawing anything, it can be a lot more difficult to demonstrate control. Well, you can see the advantages. The multiple baseline is very common. You, see, you can see the advantages. You get four participants and you get your IV and you can quickly see an effect of an IV across multiple participants. So multiple baseline design is a very, very useful experimental design when you have more than one subject. Multi-element designs, also known as alternating treatment designs, is exactly what it sounds like. Okay? Alternating treatments rapidly to determine which one is best, which one identifies or has the most experimental control. If we look at our baseline, so we have, we're just making it simple, square, circle, triangle. So our baseline here, okay, they're all, all the data paths are crossing. And when you're looking for ex uh, experimental control in a multi-element design or an alternating treatment design, you want separation from your data, data paths. As you can see in our intervention phase or intervention condition, condition, there's significant separation between our data paths, thus experiment, or demonstrating experimental control. So this is number of per or percent of trials with compliance. And give, give snack is, let's say, you know, high uh, 70, 80, 90% toy away. They're averaging it out, you know, down to 30% to 60%. And then come here is very low. So you would say give snack has the most experimental control. And you can see they're rapidly alternating between each treatment. So they started with the give snack, right? And then come here and then toy away. And obviously I'm not going through the exact way they did this. We're just giving examples point is the multi-element design is allowing them to give all these different IVs a chance all at once. So you can see how it can be very, very good uh, for time constraints, right? Or when you just want to rapidly figure out what's going to work or what isn't. So rapidly alternate conditions takes place all in the same phase. 
you can see all of our uh, interventions or our conditions are in the same exact space. Equal opportunities for conditions to be present during measurement. You can test more than two conditions at one time, but usually you want to max out at four. Our design here has three. Experimental control is demonstrated when the data paths do not overlap. And that is key. So what's some, what are some advantages? Well, no withdrawal needed. We're not going to withdraw anything here. We don't have to. You, you might be able to. You can, but you don't have to. And then multiple IVs can be tried rapidly. You can see square, triangle, and circle are all being rapidly tested and rotated. And disadvantages. Well, multiple treatment interference can impact measurement. What does that mean? Well, if we are doing three different treatments, eventually the learner might start to actually learn. And so what can happen is if we start really low on one treatment, the longer we go alternating, alternating, and the more the client learns, well, that low treatment might start to creep up just because of multiple treatment interference, right? The client is starting to learn. So we have to be careful about that. So you want to control how much you're actually alternating your treatment, okay? And you need to be aware the further down the line you get in alternating treatment, the more that multiple treatments might be interfering with the actual data. Finally, changing criterion. I love changing criterion design. Nerdy. You know, we're a nerdy field. I love it. It's my favorite experimental design. Changing criterion, we are increasing or decreasing behaviors in a person's repertoire. So you can see we have our little baseline here. And what are we doing? Well, we're trying to increase the number of responses over sessions through treatment. So you can see our first criterion is 10. Bump it up, bump it up, bump it up, bump it up, bump it up. Notice how the data points all go around or sit on top of our criterion. You don't want your criterions to change and the data points to be too far away from each criterion. Okay? You want your criterion to be controlling the behavior. So this is ideal. Right. You want your data points close to the criterion line, not all over the place and not super variable. Why? Because if you look at the top here, when they reverse it, right, you can see the behavior changes with the criterion. And thus they're exper they're demonstrating experimental control. So this is ideal. Now, meant to increase or decrease behavior in a learner's repertoire, which is fantastic because as part of our advantage, you can actually complement your goals, right? Each phase in the design serves as the baseline for next phase, meaning if we look at our first phase here, this is just baseline for our next criterion, so on and so forth. Phases must be long enough to achieve stable responding, but should vary. Notice that all of our responding is very stable, but the length does vary. You go from five to three to, what is that, seven, four, three, and then the more time the criterion changes, the stronger show of experimental control. This is a strong demonstration of experimental control. Phases change often. There are a lot of them. There are different lengths. And you can see the behavior moves right along on top of criterion. Advantages does not require withdrawal. You can enable practitioners to improve behavior during research or actually complement your goals. However, the target behavior must be in the learner's repertoire. We're not teaching a skill here, right? We're increasing or decreasing something, okay? It already must be known. And it may impede learning because if you're, sorry, if your client is learning very quickly, you still need to adhere to the changing criterion design guidelines and you don't want to just jump up rapidly. So it can possibly impede. Finally, baseline logic, prediction, verification, Replication, this is what we're trying to do with our data. And you might have seen the top image many, many times, especially in your classes. The bottom image is our multiple baseline, baseline logic. Prediction, we're anticipating the outcome of a previously unknown future measurement. Typically, we're going to predict what baseline would do if we didn't intervene. So if you look at the top picture, our blank dots are our clear dots, okay? Our, our prediction. If we aren't intervening, we predict baseline is going to continue as is. Bottom picture, same way. If we don't intervene, baseline will continue as is. Verification, we're going to verify that prior level of baseline would remain unchanged. So we're predicting and then we're verifying. So how do we do that? Well, if you look at the top one, we withdraw. You can see our baseline goes back down to our prediction. 
if you go to the bottom picture. Our second baseline continues just as is, thus verifying our prediction. And then replication, we're repeating conditions within an experiment, exactly what it sounds like. So top picture, we have our treatment one. We withdraw it, go back to treatment two. We're replicating treatment one. Same thing with the bottom picture. We implement treatment and behavior one, and then we drop down here, the grids. We implement treatment two. We're replicating treatment as well. Baseline logic is not overly complicated. Okay, don't make it harder than it is, right? Prediction, verification, replication. You know those three. Understand these little charts. You're going to be just fine. All right, great. Finish it up. Single subject experimental design. Again, most common type of design in ABA. Individuals serve as their own control. Researchers attempt to predict, verify, and replicate. Ideally, we want to prove experimental control. Reversals, multiple baselines, multiple probes. Alternating treatments or multi-elements and changing criterions. All right. Thank you for watching. BCBAstudy.com for our BCBA materials. RBTexamReview.com for RBT materials. Subscribe. Join. Let us know. Questions, comments. As always, hard. Study hard.